Many organizations have migrated to the public cloud and are looking for ways to optimize their IaaS and PaaS spend. Today, I'm going to share with you my favorite tips on how to optimize your IaaS and PaaS costs. Welcome back everyone, my name is Elias Kinaser and today we're going to answer the question, how do I optimize my IaaS and PaaS costs? Now, I'm sure there's a lot of tips and tricks out there, but I've compiled what I think are the best tips that you can use to optimize these costs. Now, if you like this type of content, make sure you smash that like button, share, subscribe, make sure you leave a comment below in case I've missed anything and I'd love to have a conversation about these tips and potentially others that you found during your adoption of public cloud. Let's start with tip number one, which is to use discount models. Now, if your organization hasn't signed an enterprise agreement yet with a cloud provider, I would highly recommend that you engage your procurement uh, or whoever is responsible for these types of contracts and make sure you craft a contract that gives you discounts as part of using this cloud provider's platform. Now, with cloud, although we go to cloud for the pay-as-you-go types of services, there are a lot of workloads that don't necessarily work well with pay-as-you-go because you have them powered on all the time. This is where enterprise agreements can come in and help because they're able to extend a discount for you for these types of workloads. You can also put things in the enterprise agreement like egress traffic costs. This is where you can negotiate with the cloud provider on these types of costs. So if you don't have an EA in place yet, I would highly recommend that you do that. You should also leverage different discount models that these cloud providers offer. For example, AWS will offer reserved instances, Azure will offer reserved VM instances, Google will offer committed use, so the more that you use the platform, the more discounts that you get. Again, AWS will offer things like reserved instances for RDS, Azure will offer reserved capacity for SQL, and so on and so forth. There's all of these discount models. If you're not leveraging them as part of architecting, as part of designing your workload, then you're not properly optimizing, and I would highly recommend that you do so. Tip number two, continuously right size. And you're going to hear me say continuously a lot. So typically when you're designing a workload and the, depending on the type of workload it is, the requirements for this workload are often more than what the workload actually needs. So if you're able to over time realize or figure out or audit this workload so that you can give it less capacity than what it is actually using, you're going to right size it to those resources that it actually needs. So if you've originally assigned maybe more CPUs to the workload or more memory to the workload, or you've given it more IOPS than the workload really needs, right sizing it to the right capacity will then significantly reduce the cost of this workload. Tip number three, leverage third-party optimization tools. Now the cloud providers will all give you some native tools that you can use to optimize your spend. So AWS will have Trusted Advisor, Azure will have Advisor. So there's all of these tools that you can use. These are tools that are going to monitor your workloads over time and they're going to make recommendations based on how they see these workloads being used. This is where these tools can be, uh, you can use them in conjunction with right sizing to find out some of these resources that you may be underutilizing or overutilizing so that you can adjust properly. Now, the native tools will only take you so far. This is where third-party tools will really give you advanced features and capabilities, and I highly recommend that you use them in order to continuously optimize your cost. These tools will also notify you when it's a good idea, for example, to leverage reserved instances. Some will even offer you to buy reserved instances for them that may be cheaper than buying it directly from AWS because they're buying larger chunks of these reserved instances. So take a look at what these third-party tools can offer and leverage them, use them to your advantage. Tip number four, enforce tagging. I can't tell you how important it is to actually have a tagging strategy, to not allow any kind of asset to be created, to be provisioned on the cloud provider without having a tag associated with it. You can enforce that using policy. So if anyone is trying to create an asset, that asset needs to be charged back somewhere. We need to know who's creating it, why they're creating it. So using tags allows you to very easily then restructure the bill when it comes at the end of the month and you can figure out who's using these resources and how much it's costing. And what you could do with that is you can then bill them back. You can go have a conversation with them as far as 
Are you still using all of these resources? Tagging is a very, very strong ally that you have at your disposal, a very strong tool that you have at your disposal to be able to identify who's using what and to ensure nothing gets created without someone being held responsible for this asset and for its consumption. Tip number five, continuously audit. Now, we talked a little bit about auditing when we talked about right sizing. Now, auditing has an automated aspect to it where you're leveraging third-party tools that this is one form of auditing. But auditing also will have to do with looking at some of these resources and maybe having a conversation with the owner of these resources as far as whether or not they are still needed. So although as part of the auditing, the audit might show that, yes, this resource is being used to some degree, but it could be just a, an application or a resource that's generating data or information, but nobody really needs it anymore. So having a conversation with the group, with the department, with the person that created this asset over a period of time of whether or not this is still needed and for how long and how is it going to be used so that you can figure out again how to associate it with the right discount model. So a part of this you can do automatically using third-party tools or the native tools. A part of this you're going to have to do manually by auditing these instances and figuring out whether or not they are still needed. Again, this is one part that you can reduce sprawl or spend sprawl or instant sprawl in your IaaS and PaaS environment. Tip number six, implement storage lifecycle management. This is crucial because if you have an object storage and everything is going onto the standard tier, that is your most expensive tier. You want to be able to implement a policy that says, for example, after six months, I want you to move it from the standard tier, maybe to the non-standard tier. 18 months after that, I want you to move it from that tier, maybe to archive, that's long-term storage. So being able to have some kind of a policy that will automatically move unused resources after a certain period of time between the different tiers will significantly optimize the use of storage and the cost of storage for your organization. Tip number seven, design with cost optimization in mind. Now, what does that mean, Eli? That means every technical decision that you make when you're designing has an immediate cost implication. If you don't change your mindset and you simply take everything that you've learned on-premises and implement that in the cloud, you will find that there are really no cost savings in the cloud. So what I implore you to do here is to use cost optimization. Optimize the workload as you're moving it. Every workload can be optimized in some way, shape, or form. Now, some workloads can be optimized more, other workloads can be optimized less, but every workload can be optimized. Examples, if you're using an F5 load balancer on-premises, maybe a Citrix Netscaler on-premises, consider using the cloud provider's native load balancer. If you've got a web server farm that consists of 20 servers or more on-premises, consider using Auto Scaling Group put fewer instances in this auto-scaling group, create the right automation around it, and then add or remove instances or virtual machines as needed as you're consuming them. Instead of using databases inside of virtual machines, use database as a service. Leverage the PaaS layer as much as you can, whether it's serverless, whether it's container cluster management, whether it's queuing services, wherever you can, leverage PaaS. As you're leveraging paths, you're significantly optimizing not only your spend, but also the operational cost that's associated with it. So what we want to do is we want to reduce the immediate cost, but we also want to reduce how much it takes us to manage a certain asset, to make it highly available, to back it up, to monitor it. All of these things are hidden costs. By leveraging paths, we are significantly reducing that. So when you're designing, you have to design with cost optimization. Take advantage of the tools that you have at your disposal as opposed to just lifting and shifting, for example. Tip number eight, use spot instances. Now the major cloud providers, at least the top three cloud providers all have these types of instances. Now spot instances are instances that the provider will offer at a significantly discounted rate, hourly rate, by the minute rate, et cetera. Now, the reason they're offering it to you at a discounted rate, most of these cloud providers will have overcapacity. And one way for them to take advantage of this overcapacity is to put it on some sort of a, an auction market, so to speak, where you can bid on the instance and say, I'm willing to pay 
this much to take this number of compute instances. Now there is a trick here in that these types of instances can be turned off by the provider at any point if they need this capacity. So when you're using spot instances, make sure that you're using them for the right type of workload. So for example, high performance compute, Hadoop clusters, anything that is stateless, anything that is like a batch job type of uh, a workload, these types of workloads will work really well for this type of an instance. So you're able to get a large number of CPU or GPU you for a significantly reduced cost with as long as you're aware of the gotcha but this is one way that again you can significantly optimize the usage of that workload tip number nine upgrade your instances on a fairly regular basis now cloud providers will throughout the year introduce new instances new generations of the same family that are geared towards the same workload that you're currently using but these are gonna get introduced at a reduced price because they are more efficient. And as a result, you can take advantage of that by upgrading the instances uh, as well. Tip number 10, scheduled resources. This is often an overlooked thing. Now, this is something that we used to talk about early on when we adopted cloud. And then for some reason, a lot of folks started to forget about it. But there are a lot of workloads that will be idle for hours on out. So if you have a workload that's only going to be used during the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., then make sure that you schedule it to turn off between the hours of 7 p.m. and say 5 a.m. That's a long stretch of hours where you could be saving on the cost of these resources. So continue to use schedule scheduling. Don't just forget about it. Don't just put it under the umbrella of the enterprise agreement. If you can optimize that workload, if the workload doesn't need to be powered on 24 seven, then set a schedule for it so that it powers off during non-peak or non-usage hours. Tip number 11, implement chargeback or at least implement showback. Now, if you're gonna use third-party tools to help you optimize your environment, if you're going to enforce tagging like we talked about earlier, if you're going to be enabling or enforcing auditing or continuously auditing the environment, then you should be, be able to fairly easily create a showback model, where at the end of the month when you receive the bill based on the number of tags and how you're grouping these tags, be able to go to the marketing department, be able to go to the developers of a specific application and have a conversation with regards to how much they've spent this month at AWS or Azure or Google. This will help you then justify this from a business perspective. When the business comes and says, hey, you know, our AWS bill is so high, IT is spending all of this money, you're able to then show them a report that shows who exactly is using these resources. And at that point, these resources can then be tagged to the business function, the business driver, the business reason why they are being utilized. And that becomes a strong justification. Now, chargeback is a little more complex because you have to uh, integrate it with your ERP system. You have to uh, you know, put a metric around it. So if you can't do chargeback, which most companies don't really do, a showback model is the next best thing. Tip number 12, reward financial responsibility. So for those departments, for those architects, for those folks that are continuously optimizing the environment, that are designing with cost optimization in mind, that are leveraging automation, that are leveraging paths, that are doing all of the right things, we wanna incentivize them somehow. Maybe that's a bonus, maybe it's a couple of days off, maybe it's a promotion of some sort, whatever the case is. But we wanna start establishing a precedence where our organization recognizes individuals, departments that are financially responsible for the assets that they're using in the cloud for how they're using the cloud. That is a very important step as part of your continuous optimization is to have buy-in, is to not always put the honest on you so that you're the only one that's all, always chasing after all of these individuals or departments. Make sure they're aware of the importance of this so that they can then react to it as well. This will then feed into another important thing that you should always be doing, which, which is shifting the budget responsibility. It's not on you to always justify this. When you implement a chargeback or a showback model, when you enforce tagging, you have all of the tools, all of the capabilities at your disposal to be able to break down where the spend is going. Where we're spending is very transparent. You're able to generate a report and say, 
marketing department, accounting department, development department of product A, or development department of product B, you are spending X, Y, or Z. You are now moving the budget responsibility from IT, from centralized IT, onto the business. You wanna to get to a place, to a, to a single maybe point in time where you don't have a budget, right? As IT, you don't have a budget. If somebody requires cloud services, if somebody requires IT services of any sort, even in the data center, they are going to be responsible for finding the budget. You are simply a service organization. You're offering up your expertise, your talents, your skills, your best practices to maintain their environment for them. So in essence, you're becoming a managed services environment within the organization. But instead of paying a third party for that, you're doing that for the different stakeholders, the different departments. That is a very powerful proposition because the business can no longer view IT as this black hole that we constantly put money in. As a result, they now see exactly where the spend is. This is where you want to get at with this type of a strategy. Did you like my tips? Or did you find them helpful? Did I miss anything? Do you have any tips that maybe I am not using? I'd love to hear from you in the comment below. If you like this type of content, make sure you like, you subscribe, smash that like button actually for me. Help me grow this channel. Thank you so much for watching to the end. I hope this was helpful. I love you all and I'll see you in the next one.